welcome viewers to the e learning program of uh, hindustan institute of uh, maritime training so this uh, e learning module is on hydrogen as an alternative fuel so at the end of this module the participant is expected to have understood the following what your fuel is which are the power generating machineries that use fuel what are the requirements to be fulfilled by a fuel the iso requirements to be fulfilled by the fuel so that it can be used on board ships for ic engines boilers and the gas turbines and conventionally what fuels are in use in the marine industry what is the need to look for alternative fuels which gases emitted after combustion of fuel are to be reduced to protect our environment the requirements to be fulfilled by the fuel as per marpol annex 6 regulation 13 to control the nox emission and which national and local bodies introduce and enforce regulations in addition to marpol which are aimed at reducing pollution the requirements to be fulfilled by a fuel as per regulation 14 of marpol annex 6 to control the sox emission the emission control targets which have been fixed by mepc in their resolution 304 adopted in april 2018 and what life cycle emission is what are the alternative fuels available what is the projected marine fuel use from 2025 to 2050 so that the target fixed by imo imo can be achieved the contribution of hydrogen as a marine fuel the different types of hydrogen based on the sources and the production processes the amount of carbon release during the production of various types of hydrogen comparing the properties of hydrogen with the properties of uh, conventional fuels matching power generating systems with the uh, hydrogen fuel the benefits of using hydrogen as a fuel and the challenges in adapting hydrogen as a marine fuel so what's a fuel it is one of the energy sources a combustible substance containing carbon and hydrogen upon combustion it releases the energy so which are the power generating machineries that use fuel ic engines steam turbines gas turbines and the fuel cells in ic engines steam turbines and gas turbines the fuel is combusted and it releases the energy whereas in fuel cells an electrochemical process takes place which produce electricity there is no combustion there is no emission products so what are the requirements of a good fuel 
we should have high calorific value low moisture content a moderate ignition temperature the low content of uh, non combustible matter in the form of ash or clinker the combustion is controllable and it has a moderate velocity of combustion low cost also it should not give any offensive odor and more importantly it has to fulfill the international national and local environmental regulations which are aimed at reducing pollution and make shipping sustainable regarding the technical requirements to be fulfilled by the fuel the iso 8217 specifies the requirements to be fulfilled for use for fuel use in marine diesel engines and boilers so it specifies uh, the kinematic viscosity cold flow properties such as pore point the catalyst finds content the maximum density ctn index flash point oxidation stability the sulfur content water content ash content hydrogen sulfide content acid number carbon residues etc and similarly for the gas turbines the fuel requirements are specified in iso 4261 so these iso requirements uh, are technical requirements if you look at the sulfur content specified in iso it is uh, more than the statutory requirement so the consumer of the fuel has to specify what sulfur content uh, limit uh, he wants so it has to be specified in the order the major fuels which are in use at present are mgo hfo and mdo mgo is a marine gas oil ISO 8217 specifies seven categories of distillate fuels out of which one is for diesel engines used for emergency purposes such as in emergency generator engines emergency fire pump engine or life boat engines etc because the as per the solas the flash point of fuel used on board is a minimum 60 degree centigrade but for the fuels which are used in emergency machinery is mentioned the limit is a minimum it has to be 43 degree centigrade so iso 8217 specifies one category for usage for the emergency purposes hfo is a we fuel oil which is a residual oil and the iso 8217 specifies six categories of residual fuels and uh, it is also we can see to get uh, you know different uh, viscosity uh, certain uh, uh, grades of av fuel oil will be mixed with uh, a little bit of a uh, little bit grade of uh, distillate fuel oils to achieve the required uh, viscosity as well as the density and uh, as per uh, iso 8217 
the maximum density is uh, 1010 kilogram per cubic meter at 15 degree centigrade a maximum viscosity of HFO used on board is 700 centistokes at 50 degree centigrade so this fuel heavy fuel oil because it is uh, cheaper than other fuels more than 87 percentage of the marine fuel in use is a heavy fuel oil. MDO is a marine diesel oil which is a blend of uh, the distillate fuel with a, a small proportion of uh, heavy oil. So, these uh, fuels we have been using for them more than 100 years. So, why are we looking for an alternative fuel now? It is because of the international, national and local regulations which are aimed at reducing pollution. We are looking for alternative fuel. So, which are the, the regulation forming and enforcing bodies, the internationally IMO, International Maritime Organization and uh, nationally uh, the European Union, the United States uh, Environmental Protection Agency, the California Air Resources Board, Norwegian Maritime Authority and others, they frame the regulations and they enforce. So, the gases which are aimed at for reducing pollution are sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides, carbon dioxide and total greenhouse gases. So, we uh, you know we split carbon dioxide, total greenhouse gases and all. Why we mention separately? It is because of the, the targets that is fixed by IMO to be achieved by 2050. So, they have mentioned one is uh, how much carbon dioxide has to be reduced, how much total greenhouse gases to be reduced. That is why it is given separately here. And a Marple, an Marple Annex 6 Regulation 13, it limits the NOx emissions from uh, diesel engines which are uh, used uh, in ship and which are over 130 kilowatt. The exception from these uh, limits imposed as per uh, regulation 13 is uh, emergency generator engine, emergency fire pump engines and live boat engines. So, as per the Annex 6, NOx uh, limits imposed by IMO, there are uh, three tires, tire 1, tire 2 and tire 3 limits. We can see here in the x axis, the RPM is mentioned and in the y axis, the NOx emission in uh, gram per kilowatt hour is mentioned. So, the tire 1 limit the top cow that is uh, for the engines which are uh, which are used in the ships built after 1st of January 2000. So, we can see higher emission limits are uh, imposed. So, these uh, uh, emission limits they are uh, based on the RPM for a different RPM, different limits are given. And the tire 2 is for ships constructed after 1st January 2011. So, it has a reduced NOx emission limits. The tire 3, the bottommost line is for the 
ships to enter into emission control areas these they have they should have engines which are tier 3 compliant then only they can enter into emission control areas apart from imo the additional measures are introduced to limit the nox by the national bodies such as us environmental protection agency california air resource board and the norwegian maritime authority and regarding regulation 14 of uh, marpol annex 6 this uh, regulation limits the sulfur content in the marine fuel it limits it to 0.5% or less globally and uh, it limits it to 0.1 percentage in an emission control areas the limit of 0.1 percentage in emission control area has been there from 2015 and the 0.5 percentage globally has been there in force from 2020 so having already met the limits set by imo as far as the nox and the sox emission criteria is concerned now what is challenging the maritime industry the most is in achieving the targets as fixed by imo mepc through resolution 304 adopted in 2018 as per this resolution the carbon intensity of international shipping should decline and it should be reduced the should reduce the co2 emissions per transport work by at least 40 percentage by 2030 and 70 percentage by 2050 as compared to 2008 co2 emission level per transport work here when we talk about transport work that is the co2 emissions per mile per ton of cargo so how much co2 emissions so that is that has to be brought down from 2008 level by 40 percentage by 2030 and by 70 percentage by 2050 and another target is to reduce the total annual greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50 percentage by 2050 compared to 2008 level so how is this target going to be achieved one is by technical operational approaches and another one by introducing alternative fuels because hfo if you see the carbon number of hfo it it's the around c50 c40 in that range if the carbon content is more the carbon content is more the co2 emission will be more so we have to look for alternative fuels which has got less carbon or even carbon less such as hydrogen or ammonia so that is how we have to achieve the targets set by imo mepc resolution the imo is investigating and setting requirements for greenhouse gas from a fuel life cycle perspective what is fuel life cycle perspective what is life cycle emission see some um, emissions take place when the fuel is produced 
and some emission takes place when the fuel produced is transported from the production side to the ship so that emission is called well to tank emission and certain emissions take place when the fuel is combusted in the ship for producing energy that is called tank to wake emission so well to tank emission plus tank to wake emission that is called well to wake emission that is the net emission impact so when we we cannot look only into what emission takes place during the combustion phase in ship we have to take into account what emissions takes place during its production so the total emission that is the net emission impact that is what we call like life cycle emission of a fuel so the alternative fuels available are lng liquefied natural gas lpg liquefied petroleum gas methanol hydrogen ammonia biofuels so we have many alternative fuels in that uh, the bunkering availability if we consider lng and lpg is available regionally europe has taken the lead in introducing lng in the ships which are operating in europe so they have established uh, the bunkering facilities in many ports in europe and now uh, even in singapore uh, they are making singapore a uh, hub bunkering hub for lng globally so but these two fuels have got uh, the bunkering facilities available regionally whether for, but the methanol hydrogen ammonia and biofuels now only the bunkering capacity is being uh, developed even though we have got uh, many alternative fuels most of them are under research and developmental stage so the ship owners they are not very they are not clear which new fuels uh, would be the best option to be chosen for their new ships to be placed on order so that is why they are holding on new ship orders we can see in this the ship orders fell by 10 percentage in 2019 and it fell by 50 percentage in 2020 we can see there is a slump in the ship orders and this is the this is the least ship orders what we can see in the last two decades by the end of 2020 12.3 percentage vessels on order have alternative fuel propulsion compared with just 0.6 percentage of the current global fleet so in that 12.3 percentage lng fuel the ships make up 8 percentage so why lng is a lead contender for a transition fuel is because co2 emissions are lower and it is readily available if we look at the projected marine fuel use from 2025 to 2050 in 
the oil based fuel such as heavy fuel oil mgo mdo still is a 95 percentage if the rest of the alternative fuels uh, they contribute only 5 percentage of uh, total marine fuel use as we proceed towards uh, 2050 the oil based fuel is uh, slowly dropping and it is uh, coming to 40 percentage of the marine fuel use so which alternative fuel is a uh, occupying this position okay, we look here this is hydrogen and ammonia is going to contribute around 35 percentage of the total marine fuel use in 2050 and in 2025 its uh, use is nowhere but is picking up later is only at the end of this decade its use stops but it picks up faster why because a lot of research and development is going on mainly because the hydrogen is not having any carbon it's only hydrogen so no co2 emission that's why a lot of research is going on so based on the research and development and how the target set by the IMO can be fulfilled it is only by bringing hydrogen and ammonia into the usage it can be achieved if you look at the LNG use in 2025 it is around 2 percentage slowly grows up in 10 years it is occupying around 10 percentage of the marine fuel use and it becomes steady till 2050 so as of now the technology to use lng is there and it has got a low carbon compared to the hfo and mdo is only then basically it's a methane ch4 so is only one carbon is there but thereby they expect to bring down the carbon emission co2 emission by 25 percentage but completely it cannot be stopped if we look at the other fuels such as the methanol biofuels is all put together is 3 percentage in 2025 and slowly growing and totally it's occupying around 15 percentage of the total marine fuel use so even though the hydrogen will be a beginning it will kick late is going to grow at a faster Pace so that the IMO targets can be achieved. So, we are going to see the benefits and the challenges being posed by hydrogen as uh, adopting the marine fuel. So, we have recognized the hydrogen's uh, potential to generate electricity through fuel cells and uh, combustion technologies. In combustion engines or gas turbines, hydrogen can be used to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The availability is concerned is a compound of either water or methane. It is produced by processing natural gas or coal and during this process we get hydrogen gas as well as the CO2. And it can also be produced by electrolysis process of water. So, 
depending upon the source and the production pathway there are four types of hydrogen one is the gray hydrogen brown hydrogen blue hydrogen and the green hydrogen gray hydrogen is produced by processing of natural gas so during the production process 71 gram of co2 is emitted per megajoule of hydrogen produced 75 percentage of hydrogen produced in the world is of gray hydrogen brown hydrogen is produced by processing coal 166 gram of co2 is emitted per megajoule of hydrogen produced so here the we can see compared to gray hydrogen the co2 emission is more than two times so 23 percentage of hydrogen produced in the world is of brown hydrogen china is producing the maximum brown hydrogen blue hydrogen is produced by processing the fossil fuels in addition it will be employing emission control technologies such as carbon capture utilization and storage methods so during the production during the processing of fossil fuels co2 will be released that co2 instead of releasing to the atmosphere it will be captured by these uh, technologies and it will be utilized uh, somewhere else where whichever industry wants it can be used that is this uh, blue hydrogen only very few plants in the world uh, they are producing blue hydrogen and uh, it is negligible quantity only still the technology has to develop the uh, as of now uh, apart from land filling the co2 that is uh, captured the co2 is utilized to uh, remove the by pumping the co2 into the depleted wells they are trying to get the oils there so thereby 50 percentage of co2 is a super critical co2 uh, will be filled in the depleted well and uh, 50 percentage will be coming up along with the oil that co2 will be again captured and it will be utilized so this uh, has to pick up the green hydrogen is concerned it is by electrolysis process of water the hydro green hydrogen is produced moreover the electricity what is required for the electrolysis process uh, has to be from renewable energy sources there is no point in consuming electricity which is produced by Uh, the, the thermal power plants so it is the renewable sources are employed such as wind power solar power uh, if it is employed like that and the hydrogen is produced by electrolysis process then it is called a green hydrogen so 2 percentage of hydrogen produced in the world is of uh, green hydrogen and uh, the carbon release from various uh, hydrogen production methods is uh, compared here with the mgo the co2 released during the production of mgo it is taken as a baseline so when mgo is produced this much co2 is released it is given in 
grams per megajoule of uh, hydrogen uh, produced and uh, the here we can see when the coal is processed without uh, carbon capture technology so much of the CO2 is released per megajoule of hydrogen produced. So, this is all whatever we see it is the CO2 release during the production stage not in the combustion stage and this uh, CO2 which is released so much can be brought down to this level by a capture rate of 90 percentage using CCUS and when natural gas is uh, processed without CCUS this much CO2 is released during the production but with the CCUS 90 percentage capture rate it can be brought down to this and this is by electrolysis process and electrolysis process when we use a renewable source of electricity then the hydrogen release is uh, sorry CO2 release is zero but uh, here when we use some other electricity then definitely CO2 release will be there and uh, comparing the properties of hydrogen as with the conventional marine fuels the boiling point MgO and HFO you can see it's from ranging from 180 degree centigrade to 360 degree centigrade whereas hydrogen is minus 253 degree minus 253 degree centigrade so to store this as a fuel in a liquid form lot of energy need to be expended in the liquid density 900 for MgO, 991 for HFO is uh, in kilogram per cubic meter it is given whereas hydrogen density is only 70.8 just uh, one fourteenth of uh, we can say HFO lower heating value 42.7 megajoule per kilogram and 40.2 for HFO megajoule per kilogram but hydrogen lower heating value is 120.2 megajoule so so much of heat energy will be released when it is burnt is uh, three times more than that of HFO and uh, multiplying liquid density with the lower heating value we will get energy density in uh, megajoule per liter so even though this uh, lower heating value per kilogram is three times more than that of HFO it's only one fourteenth of uh, the HFO density so the net result is the energy density when hydrogen is uh, carried in liquid form is only 8.51 megajoule per liter compared to HFO 39.8 megajoule per liter and uh, if it is uh, carried as a gas form at 700 bar then further the energy density decreases to 4.8 so this energy density is the one which is going to decide how much volume is required to carry some quantity of energy on board the vessel so that is here if we see compared volume to MGO is 4.51 times more volume is required to carry the same energy when compared to MGO in a liquid form 
but if it is carried in a gaseous form at 700 bar pressure then it is uh, almost 8 times more so we have to carry same energy that means uh, more space is required that means the cargo carrying capacity will be reduced the auto ignition is here 250 degree centigrade for MGO and HFO is very important property because at the end of uh, compression stroke when fuel is injected the fuel has to catch fire on its own so that uh, here in case of MGO and HFO the temperature auto ignition temperature what we see here is less than what we will be attaining at the end of compressor inside the cylinder. So, upon injection, this catches fire on its own, but the hydrogen auto ignition temperature is 585. That means this is more than what temperature we achieve at the end of compression stroke. This cannot catch fire on its own. So, a pilot injection of diesel is required the pilot injection of around 1 to 5, 5 percentage of the total fuel the diesel has to be injected it will catch fire then the hydrogen will catch fire so the flash point it has to be MGO and HFO has to be minimum 60 degree centigrade and hydrogen is minus 253 degree centigrade So, it can flash at any temperature above minus 253 degree centigrade when a spark is given. So, highly hazardous, fire hazardous. So, the, if the vessel has to carry or use fuel which is gaseous fuel or having a flash point less than 60 degree centigrade then it has to comply with the requirements of uh, IGF code. So, it is the international code for the safe uh, handling. It is for the vessels which are carrying gaseous fuels or low flash point fuels, uh, uh, it has been provided and uh, it gives the uh, design requirements, the construction requirements and operational requirements for the safe handling, storage and operation. So, it gives the uh, requirements, the regulations. The LEL, lower explosive limit of MGO is 0.7 percentage volume fraction and the UEL is 5 percentage for MGO. So, within this uh, LEL and the UEL only the fuel upon a spark being given is a flammable and this is a narrow range and even for HFO it is from 1 percentage to 6 percentage, it is a narrow range. But for hydrogen, LEL is 4 percentage and UEL is 75 percentage which is a wide range. So again, more fire hazards. The minimum ignition energy in millijoule for MGO is 20 and HFO is 20. But for hydrogen, it is only 0 0.02 millijoule. Only the energy to create a fire is only very little. So it is so due to all these reasons, it is the hydrogen is highly hazardous. Matching power generating systems with the fuel. We know MGO and HFO, they are in use in IC engines, gas turbines, steam turbines for quite long time. And 
its usage in fuel cell is concerned is compatible in principle but under research and development but when we look at the hydrogen it is uh, compatible and readily applicable in a fuel cell usage but uh, to be used in ic engines gas turbines and steam turbines uh, the, it is compatible in principle but uh, it is under research and developmental stage uh, even though the first uh, hydrogen fueled uh, ship which was uh, released in 2017 hydroville it has a uh, an engine which uh, uses which combust hydrogen along with the diesel as a as a, the hydrogen also is you know hydrogen along with the diesel is combusted so here the hydrogen is carried in 200 liters of tanks 12 tanks are there and they carry at 200 bar pressure and the diesel also is being carried in two tanks of 205 liters capacity each it's a small vessel ferry so there uh, they burn the hydrogen in the ic engines but it is under a research and developmental stage we look at the benefits of hydrogen we know it is carbon free there is no sulfur it can be produced renewably from electrical energy and the bio renewable processes even though as of now the green hydrogen production is only 2% of the total hydrogen production in the world there is a production green hydrogen has to be encouraged it can be stored and transported as a liquid or gas and it is a commercial product on land and the hydrogen is being used in other industries and in case of fuel cells there is no gaseous emission there is no particulate matter there is no greenhouse gas emission there it is only the hydrogen and the oxygen is supplied and the, the by product is hot water that's all and uh, it is a highly buoyant and disposes if leaked in case it leaks due to its uh, very low density it just uh, disappears in a short period of time to the atmosphere so even if it is uh, leaked at a liquid hyd hydrogen temperature it is uh, it disappears easily hydrogen is a zero carbon marine fuel when it is com consumed in a mono fuel internal combustion engine but uh, when it is uh, used with the diesel uh, the diesel being pilot fuel it's uh, still the co2 emission is reduced to great extent because the pilot fuel usage is only around 1 to 5 percentage and the hydrogen can be blended with the fuel such as lng thereby the exhaust gas emissions can be reduced and the greenhouse gas footprint can be reduced it can be co-combusted with the diesel and reducing nox emissions the energy content per unit mass is the highest which is at 120.2 megajoule per kilogram because the mass energy of uh, hydrogen exceeds mgo by 2.8 times and alcohols by 5 to 6 times it increases the effective efficiency of an engine 
and it helps to reduce the specific fuel consumption and moreover it is a non toxic so even though there are so many advantages we have seen of using hydrogen as a fuel there are challenges in adopting hydrogen as a marine fuel already we have seen because of uh, lower volumetric uh, energy density the space requirement to carry same energy is uh, many times more than that of uh, mgo apart from that it has to be carried in uh, uh, if liquid form at minus 253 degree centigrade that means uh, again the space requirement increases for uh, providing insulation as well as uh, the structural arrangements for its for the cryogenic uh, storage so further the space increases and the fire hazard we have already seen the fire the flammability range is quite high and this flammability range from 4 to 75 percentage further increases widens when it is mixed with the pure oxygen and it has got a very low ignition energy and it quickly forms a flammable gas mixture apart from that the electrostatic charge build up takes place when hydrogen is uh, passed in a pipeline or due to sloshing of the fuel inside the tank there is a build up so the hydrogen handling equipment are to be protected from electric charge build up and from you know potential sparks and the hydrogen flames are invisible so the fire detection system has to be compatible with the with these things and burns quickly with a maximum speed of 3.15 meters per second the contained areas are susceptible to fire hazards so apart from uh, providing fire detection systems uh, as to be pressure release devices and the relief valves etc to be fitted and because it is uh, stored at a very low temperature the other common gases are compounds which come in contact with these uh, low temperature uh, equipments can liquefy or solidify and the human contact with the cryogenic materials or uninsulated tanks pipes or walls can cause cold burns also and moreover the, there are uh, material challenges in uh, the handling and in the storage the cryogenic tanks require thicker insulation layers the insulation layers required around 3 times more than what is required for lng storage and vacuum insulated type c tanks are also used and this gas is capable of dispersion through materials they penetrate into the walls of containment systems and permeation into certain fluids and other solid materials so they have to be stored in appropriate materials that minimize permeation and reduce the loss of contained hydrogen and another problem is hydrogen embrittlement this occurs when hydrogen is absorbed by a metal and a collect set grain boundaries creating weak spots within the material so it, this leads to microscopic fractures 
material cracks and leaks the other challenges as we have seen more energy input to be stored as a liquid at a high concentrations hydrogen can act as an asphyxiant even though it is non toxic at a higher oxygen it replaces the oxygen and it can be a, an asphyxiant low availability of renewably produced hydrogen only 2% of uh, hydrogen produced is of uh, green hydrogen as of now the high cost in the transportation infrastructure has to be made the liquefied hydrogen tanks at low pressures can be susceptible to pressure build up if the temperature increases if there is a heat transfer and the insulation is not good then the pressure increase will take place and lack of marine transport experience here as the lng is concerned we have been transporting it in the shipping industry for quite long time but uh, the hydrogen the the hydrogen carriers as of now uh, uh, they are all in the building stage the hydrogen carriers are expected to come maybe in another 5 to 6 years so as of now we lack the experience of marine transport of hydrogen and fuel infrastructure and bunkering need investment in case of uh, hydro wheel it is like you know that uh, they don't bunker like how mgo and the hfo bunkering is done they don't bunker it is uh, uh, in cylinders they exchange so initially it will be done like that in small vessels and slowly slowly the bunkering infrastructure will be built up it new it needs a huge investment and the novel power generation systems require more technology innovation as well as the cost reductions and the high explosion risks are there in confined areas and the nox emissions if used in internal combustion engines are there because uh, the nitrogen is coming from uh, our uh, air so the nox emissions so these challenges are there in adopting hydrogen as fuel but uh, because uh, it is not having carbon the scientific community in the maritime sector they are doing their level best in uh, overcoming these challenges and uh, bringing hydrogen into use so that the targets of uh, imo can be achieved in time so the references i uh, made use of uh, these references in presenting this module thank you